Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Uh, awesome show planned for you today. TJ Mo in studio with us today. Uh, round of applause. TJ's back in Nashville. Uh, TJ, I, I don't know if you've got a family member, your mom, dad, brother, sister, somebody that anytime you're not on the show six, seven days in a row, uh, I get an email. What'd you do to TJ Mo? Oh, where's TJ? Where's TJ? I'm like, I've got a burner account. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, and no I, family members that care. It's me. Yeah, they 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 all think that you're gonna just disappear one day, like Sean Watson. Yeah, I'm Kevin Durant. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, anyway, so TJ Mo is relaxed. Don't send me any angry emails. TJ Mo is still with the uh, Fearless Army. He's here in studio. Uh, awesome, awesome show uh, planned today. I do want to. Let you all know you did a great job with feedback on yesterday's show. My email has been filling up. I want still more feedback from you all about yesterday's show and the possibility of a Super Bowl boycott. Uh, email me at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. You left a lot of great messages in the comments. We're probably going to circle back to that topic tomorrow on tomorrow's show. So keep the feedback coming. I, I, I really need it and appreciate it. You're doing a great job helping me formulate ideas on how we can execute it. I've reached out to some other people, uh, other uh, conservative Christian content creators to test their interest. I'm getting good, positive feedback from that as well. If you have not watched yesterday's show, I suggest you do. Uh, it, it's an important idea that I want to try to execute and, and see if we can make a difference in this country. Uh, today, we're gonna do a, some slightly different topics. Royce White's gonna be here with us. Uh, we're gonna talk about Trevor Bauer, uh, the baseball player. Relate that to Kobe Bryant a little bit. We'll have uh, Steve Kim on the show today as well. We'll talk a little bit about Trevor Bauer and Jimmy Butler and, and what's going on with Stephen A. Smith and Skip Bayless and Dan Levitard as well. It's, it's removing Brett Favre up a day. He'll be here, do some fun singing, and talk some football with Brett Favre. And then we'll end the show, I believe. Do you guys know? You, know, you guys do know that I asked to end the show with Shamika Michelle. Do, do people know that? Yeah, it's in there. Yeah, it's in there. I don't see a card here indicating that. But anyway, Shamika Michelle will be on the show at the end. Uh, I want to open up a little bit of room for this first discussion by taking care of one of my favorite sponsors. Got a new shipment of Nugenics. Uh, this is the unprecedented formula with science-backed key ingredients to safely maximize your free and total testosterone levels, help you increase muscle mass, and skyrocket your performance as you age. Nugenics is also the number one doctor recommended testosterone boosting brand. If you're not totally satisfied, Nugenics would refund 100% of your purchase price plus shipping and processing. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text 231231 and enter the code FEARLESS. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo X, our newest and most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose fast and get lean fast, absolutely free. That's 231231, enter the keyword fearless. That's 231231, enter the keyword fearless. Texting enrolls you in reoccurring automated text messages, consent not required to purchase, message and data rates, may apply, the number one doctor recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. 20 years ago, a young woman accused Kobe Bryant, the best player in basketball, of sexual assault and strangulation. The NBA took no action. As the case worked its way through the court system, Bryant continued to play. Despite initially lying to police about having sex with the woman and eventually acknowledging that he strangled her during rough sex, the NBA granted Bryant a presumption of innocence. The accuser refused to testify in court, ending the criminal proceedings. Bryant issued a public apology and paid the accuser. Two years ago, a young woman accused Trevor Bauer, the best pitcher in baseball, of sexual assault and strangulation. Three days after, after the media reported the accusations against Bauer, 
The Los Angeles Dodgers placed Bauer on administrative leave. He's never pitched in the major league since. Bauer steadfastly maintained his innocence. Prosecutors never indicted Bauer for the alleged crime. Bauer sued his accuser, Lindsey Hill, a recovering alcoholic. Hill filed a countersuit. Well, yesterday, Bauer and Hill dropped their civil suits without either side recovering or receiving a penny. Bauer immediately released a four minute video restating his innocence and revealing what appears to be damning evidence that Hill tried to extort him. Let's watch Trevor Bauer in full context. Next victim, star pitcher for the Dodgers. A text Lindsay Hill sent to a friend before she ever even met me. What should I steal? She asked another in reference to visiting my house for the first time. The answer, take his money. So how might that work? I'm going to his house Wednesday, she said. I already have my hooks in. You know how I roll. Then, after the first time we met, net worth is 51 mil, she said. Bitch, you better secure the bag, was the response. Uh, but, but how is she gonna do that? Need daddy to choke me out, she said. Being an absolute whore to try to get in on his 51 million, read another text. Uh, then, after the second time we met, former Padres pitcher Jacob Nix told her, you gotta get this bag. I'll give you 50,000, Lindsay replied. Her AA sponsor asked her at one point, do you feel a tiny bit guilty? Not really, she replied. Since then, her legal team has approached me multiple times about coming to a financial settlement. But as I have done since day one, I refuse to pay her even a single cent. Uh, in August of 2021, Lindsay Hill's claims were heard in court. And during those legal proceedings, critical information was deliberately and unlawfully concealed from me and my legal team. Uh, information like this video, which was taken by Lindsay Hill herself the morning after she claimed she was brutally attacked, emotionally traumatized, and desperate to get away from me. Uh, and now we have the metadata, so there can be no dispute. Uh, it was taken mere minutes before she left my house on the morning of May 16th, 2021, without my knowledge or consent, of course. Uh, in it, you can see her lying in bed next to me while I'm sleeping, smirking at the camera without a care in the world, or any marks on her face. I think it paints a pretty clear picture of what actually happened the evening of May 15th and why the video was originally concealed from us. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, after hearing the evidence available to her, Judge Diana Gold Saltman found that Lindsay Hill had misled the court. She found her claims to be materially misleading. Uh, she denied her request for a domestic violence restraining order, and she found that no sexual assault or non-consensual conduct took place. Now, some of you might not know about restraining order hearings. I know I didn't, but uh, I've since learned that uh, it's extremely rare for a request for a restraining order to be denied because the standard of proof that you need to obtain one is extremely low. So you can make of that what you will. The fact is I was never arrested. I was never charged with a crime and I won the only legal proceeding that took place without my side of the story even being heard. Uh, and most importantly, as I've said from day one, I never sexually assaulted Lindsay Hill or anyone else for that matter. Uh, so I sued her, which prompted her to countersue me. Quite frankly, regardless of the outcome in court, I've paid significantly more in legal fees than Lindsay Hill could ever pay me in her entire life. Uh, and I knew that would be the case going in, but the lawsuit was never about the money for me. It was the only way for me to obtain critical information to clear my name. Uh, the discovery process in that lawsuit recently concluded, at which point uh, Lindsay Hill's legal team again came to us with another proposal to resolve the case. Uh, this time, however, they weren't seeking any money from me. Having received uh, much of the information that had been hidden from us, uh, a small portion of which I've referenced here, um, I was willing to agree to the terms proposed. Both parties would drop their respective lawsuits and neither of us would pay either side any money. Um, I also retained my right to speak publicly about the case, something I have not been at liberty to do since June of 2021. So as of today, both lawsuits have been settled. Now, over the last two years, I've been forced to defend my integrity uh, and my reputation in a very public setting. But hopefully this is the last time I have to do so, as I'd prefer to just remain focused on doing my job, uh, winning baseball games and entertaining fans around the world. So today, I'm happy to be moving on with my life. Mm. So, so what happened over the last 20 years that we could see such disparate treatment of a superstar male athlete revolving around sexual encounters with a young woman. It's easy to simply blame the Me Too movement and castigate the women who have used the movement 
to bully and terrorize men. But I honestly don't blame Lindsay Hill. She has a drinking problem and obvious emotional issues. I feel sorry for her. She's apparently unstable. Men are to blame for what happened to Trevor Bauer, including Trevor Bauer himself. Our immorality and cowardice have created the current environment. Let's start with Dodgers ownership. The Guggenheim Group, which consists of Mark Walter, Magic Johnson, Peter Goober, Stan Kasten, Bobby Patton, and Todd Bowley. They could have stood by Trevor Bauer as the court proceedings played out, but they chose the easy, safe route. They distanced themselves from Bauer as soon as they could. This is what cowards do. They choose the easy path. They practice CYA constantly. Then we could move on to Rob Manfred, the commissioner of Major League Baseball. He could have insisted that the Dodgers take more of a wait and see approach with Bauer. Instead, Manfred sought to harshly punish Bauer without all the evidence. MLB originally suspended Bauer for more than 300 games. I also blame the men uh, running virtually all the corporate media outlets. Sexual assault cases are complicated, way too complicated for the kind of instant believe all women analysis that is commonplace in mainstream media. Based on what Bauer alleges in his four minute video, I blame Jacob Nix, the former Padres pitcher who reportedly encouraged Lindsey Hill to extort Bauer. Hill is from San Diego. It appears she's quite well known and connected to the baseball world. And that's why I don't leave Trevor Bauer out of the responsibility. He shoulders a great deal of blame here too. At some point, he has to recognize that he put himself in danger hooking up with an emotionally damaged drunken groupie. I get Bauer's anger. He's lost millions of dollars that he'll never recover. His reputation has been smeared. He could have avoided all the trouble had he been more mature with his approach to pursuing women. Men have fallen, we're weak, we're controlled by our lust, and we're afraid to stand on the values we boldly espouse. When Rome, the Roman Empire, when it was great, military leaders would fall on their swords if they failed in combat. Men took responsibility for their failures. We don't do that anymore. Fallen dynasties, they don't do that. Men don't stand on any principles. That's why our society is so chaotic and so corrupt right now. Men choose survival over honor. We make decisions that allow us to survive, collect the next paycheck, and avoid criticism. 20 years ago, I believe David Stern and the NBA mishandled the Kobe Bryant allegations. There is a middle ground between doing nothing to Bryant and destroying the life and career of Trevor Bauer. Bold and thoughtful leadership would find that middle ground. Cowards aren't bold and thoughtful. They're weak. Women take advantage of weak men. The Me Too movement is exactly what we men deserve. Uh, that's my fire starter, uh, Royce White. Uh, I can't wait to hear uh, your take on this and TJ as well. But Royce, I, I, I want to start with you. What do you think has happened in the 20 years from Kobe Bryant and presumption of innocence to Trevor Bauer, get rid of him, throw him under a bus? Who, who do you blame for us being here? Well, as always, I, I like you start with placing much of the blame on the American people. None of this is with none of this is out of our control because none of it is without our consent. And I don't mean the consent that that we would talk about in a sexual assault case. I mean, the consent and will of the people, we the people. So ultimately, all of it is is within our control. You know, the slow decay of this is, is all in our control. What's happening, what's took place is a different matter entirely. We're living under a soft coup. If, if communism is the most dangerous threat to Western society and, and Judeo-Christian values, the constitutional republic, 
um, then, then feminism and radical feminism and the Me Too movement are a very close second. And, and it's not by accident that the two movements are, are ideologically aligned or politically aligned, that many of your radical feminists espouse and, and, and openly uh, claim to be Marxists or, or postmodernists and, and effectively communists. Um, th- this is a way to hogtie strong men arbitrarily whenever a man rises up to, to fight back against the corruption of the status quo. They'll do, and it's not really about Trevor Bauer. I mean, the Trevor Bauer case is typical. As an athlete, we, we, this happens all the time. And I don't agree that, that any of the responsibility should fall on, on Trevor Bauer in a, in a governmental sense or, or from a, a legal standpoint. Morally, culturally, yes, but that should be at the, at the way background of our thinking right now. The, the reality is that our courts and the justice system, which hold a, a, a substantial amount of weight, uh, lean, uh, lean, very, very uh, out of balance in the direction of women and thus corrupt women. So. Royce, I like your point and can't fully disagree, but but T.J. Moe has kind of got me where I'm at mentally in terms of like, it's Mm -hmm. all a byproduct of weak men. It's Mm -hmm. all a reflection. uh, Again, we as men could get off our knees and quit apologizing and quit pretending like we owe women some sort of debt, that everything we did in the past was wrong, and and so now let's play makeup. We could cut that out, and that's part of what I've been trying to explain on this show. And and then when I just started thinking about it, and TJ, you jump in here and, and make your point, but you have been on me for a while like, hey, man, there's some weak man allowing this, and a lot of them are weak white men. Mostly all weak white men, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> we, we simultaneously complain that uh, white men own everything, right? They own all the big corporations, that virtually all the presidents and everything. Uh, but then we don't turn around and realize that, well, those are the people that could put a stop to everything. So they're the people hiring the gay black women to be your chief diversity officer. And they're the men who won't say, nah, I've had virtually all these guys, they're billionaires, right? They've all had women try to come at them that they had to pay off. All these guys knew better in the Trevor Bauer case, but they're too cowardly to put their foot down and say, I'll take whatever heat's coming, I know the truth. And so mm-hmm. as you point out, you've pointed out in your uh, mono here, they want to survive. Every last one of them wants to preserve whatever reputation they have and their $100 million or $2 billion or $10 billion and just get on with it and they don't care. And so Trevor, about the rest of us down here, this is why I, I don't think I disagree with Royce, but would, it's, it's a little more to the forefront of my thoughts. Our personal behavior is at the front of my mind because this, this is scriptural, particularly when it comes to women. You look at the men of the Bible in 1 Kings 11, it, it says that King Solomon was seduced by women and they led him away from God. Samson was seduced by Delilah and it led to his destruction. King David, it led him to commit murder and adultery. So women are going to put you in these positions and the, I, I can't make men everywhere more courageous, but I can control my personal conduct to never get in that position where I'm choking out a woman that I'm not married to while we're having sex. (laughs) Royce, you got to go hop back in here. Well, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a good piece of advice for sure. The, the, the trouble with it is, (laughs) and I'll say it as, as I've uh, cautioned many of our, our uh, public figures, leaders, in today's fight politically, um, even when your personal behavior is completely under control and moral, they'll still make these things up. And we've seen that part too. And that's what the government and, and any legal system is supposed to be there to protect. Um, not, not the oddball, the odd, the, the, the case where somebody's morality could be in question. Uh, and then, and then it ends up being that the person was manipulative, but what about just coming out uh, and, and saying, Hey, uh, this person raped me and, and there was never any, any type of interaction of the sort, Uh, you know, and, and, you know, we can, again, this is a way where, where Christians have been sort of pinned in a corner with our own uh, morals and values, our own Christian faith and, and kind of conceded the ground for tyrannical government. And it's not just around sexual politics between men and women, men and women, but, but a lot of politics, you know, stop talking about the morality of it and, and any uh, final, 
analysis of the legal system and its 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 effectiveness. It's it's in, it's inappropriate. If we're going to have a separation between church and state every time we want to keep transgender uh, books out of our out of our elementary schools, let's not bring it back into the consideration when a man falls victim to roaming, uh, raging women. I mean, part of it is is a, a lack of courage on our part. We would rather not deal with it. We would rather not pick up arms and fight back against a tyrannical government and say, hey, this man, Trevor Bauer, is is uh, is implicated in his own demise. So let's sit back and, and not do anything about it. Tyranny is tyranny. Right. And the, the presumption of innocence is one of the most one of the most sacred, one of the most sacred ideas um, that safeguards our American citizenship underneath the Constitution. We can't we, we can never do away with the presumption of innocence. And where's the EEOC? Where are the labor protection agencies? Where are people who would step in and make sure that men who are falsely uh, accused of these crimes are, have their work protected? I mean, this is kind of part and parcel of a, a corporatocracy that doesn't value work for the American people or the American worker. Work should be protected until you're proven guilty. Um, so. Uh, Royce, I, I, I get what you're saying, but at some point for me, Things have become so chaotic and so corrupt and, and so dangerous that as individual men, we're going to have to choose to live righteously if we're going to fix things. If, if, yeah. if, if, if we're going to, because the reason I can speak out boldly today and couldn't speak out boldly seven years ago is because my actions were so in contradiction to the things that I believed and said that no one would take me seriously and, and, and no one really should take someone as hypocritical as I was seriously. And, and, it's, not, and it's a struggle every single day for me. Every, this is not easy. I have to... <laughs> Virtually all of my natural instincts, I'm sorry to admit them, but they're just not good. I mean, I, it, it's a fight every day, but, but I feel like it's worth it because it's like I'm, I'm sitting here like, I just, the way, what our immorality has legitimized the immorality of women. And, and, and I can't, and I look at their behavior and I'm repulsed by it. Oh. But I yeah. know that 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 I played a role in that. You just what? Go ahead. No, 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 absolutely not. Um, you know, I, I reject. I, I reject. Yes, okay. Before God, absolutely. Before God, no doubt about it. But we we've come to a place in this country where um, to need a Christ-like figure will be the downfall. Of, of everything that we've built and to see things in these sort of totologies, right? That's kind of a totology to see things in this absolutist manner uh, impedes us from taking necessary and viable action today. Uh, and, and you can see that with Donald Trump and the support or lack thereof support for Donald Trump or any political figure for that matter. Doesn't really matter who it is. Uh, some of us in our need for a Christ-like figure will find anything wrong whether it be big or small, with the character of individuals who we should be looking to to lead and we should be willing to follow. Now, ultimately, we follow Christ in, in all spiritual matters, uh, and we look for the grace and mercy of God in spiritual matters, but we are living beings here on earth. This is the great schism between Catholicism and Protestantism. I'm just going to keep it, keep it real. This is a great schism that exists because Protestantism assumes the, 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 the position that no matter what you do, as long as you believe in Christ, you're saved. Okay, but you have an entire 75 year life to live on average and what you do during that lifetime matters and what you fail to do during that lifetime has consequences and where one finds the, the, the fine line between what they should do and what they shouldn't do has consequences. And many Christians in their Protestant faith of Christ and their redemption have allowed LGBTQ Satanists to take the country. And they've said to themselves, as long as me and my family stay faith, faith driven and Christ-like, everything is fine. And then they wake up one day and their kid is at their private school and LGBTQism is in their curriculum and they look up and go, oh, what, what's going on here? 
I mean, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? And, and I'll give you an example of this. Like for Donald Trump, for example, we could all just say right now, based on his morality or immorality, I mean, he was clearly having sexual relations with, with, a, with a porn star while he was married. That's immoral. Um, but, you know, there are many men in the Bible that were, were having struggles with morality, but still offered great contribution in their road to morality. And, and so Donald Trump, for example, like, and when I think of this, this particular issue, I don't need Donald Trump to be Christ-like in order for him to fix this issue. And I'm as big of a proponent of starting from the moral standpoint as anybody. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. That's talking about reward. It's not talking about the baseline daily function. All I need Donald Trump to do is enforce a law or get a law passed through legislation that brings severe criminal punishment on any woman who is found to be lying in matters of sexual, uh, you know, sexual accusation. That's it. And watch how fast people stop doing it. And, and I mean, there are very, and I'm not, look, I'm, I'm in fairness, I'm not saying there, are, there aren't many issues that have uh, very complicated legal and, and political uh, solutions, but this ain't one of them. This ain't one of them. Start bringing down life sentences on women who falsely accuse men of being raped. Watch how fast they stop doing it. Watch how fast the entire sexual culture changes. I mean, there are things that God has given man the discernment to be able to impact and affect, and we've kind of conceded that in, in this sort of uh, doomsday uh, perspective that we're all fallen and we're all doomed to, 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 to sin and being perfect. I don't buy it. There are, very, there are very sound, logical things we could do in our pursuit for, for peace and order, law and order, and then we can worry about perfection or, or forgiveness and redemption. Clarify your point, though, and, 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 and it won't bother me either way. But, yeah. but are you suggesting I'm arguing that I need Donald Trump or anybody to be a Christ-like figure because the only person I'm really concerned with is me? Because yeah. I, there hasn't been one accusation made against Donald Trump that I couldn't be justifiably accused of and, right. and, and couldn't say I'll struggle with all those issues today. And tomorrow. And so I, I'm not looking for Christ's life. I'm just trying to do me to the best no, of not my you. ability. No, okay. not you. Not you personally. But my, my point gotcha. is that uh, th that that sort of thinking, not, not your thinking, but a common thinking amongst the Christian community when people get caught up in, in uh, illegitimate legal matters is, well, what did they do morally that 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 exposed them to this type of corruption and tyranny. And then they use whatever that person did morally to justify why they don't have to put that much energy into Trevor Bauer's injustice. And Trevor Bauer's injustice, irregardless of his immorality, should be high up on the totem pole of our priorities as American citizens. And Kobe Bryant should have too. And all of these people who are falsely accused regardless of their morality. When I see somebody who I don't agree, if I, saw an, uh, if I saw a gay man or woman who was a communist, who um, believed in manufacturing in China, who believed in uh, a, a abortion uh, en masse, who believed in, a, in an expansive federal government and, and a military industrial complex, who believed in giving our governance over to the WHO, if I saw that person illegally apprehended by police officers or illegally uh, or unconstitutionally dealt with in a legal proceeding, I would stand in protest. I would not say, oh, because this person is a communist, let, their, you know, let them lie in, lie in that bed. Because ultimately, the gun can be swung on me when the time is, is, uh, is, is right for the establishment. And we all have to be mindful of that. Royce, don't you think it's important for those of us who are trying to make the changes that you're suggesting, which I agree with most everything that you've said, first live the righteous lives so it's harder for them to take us down as we're on this pursuit? Because what happens is you get a Donald Trump who's trying to do it and we're behind him, and yet most people, even those of them who support him, yeah. They accuse him of something. They're like, well, he might have. He probably did because it's within his character not to rape or sexual assault. But yeah, he probably did sleep with a porn star, right? And so yeah. Yeah. In, in my view, the reason it's more at the forefront of my thinking is it will be harder to take us down. Yes, they can, they can throw whatever allegations at you that, you that they want. You're absolutely right. But we saw with the Brett Kavanaugh thing, in the end, the truth won out there. 
right? If there are enough people still on this side and you can prove out the truth, living righteously does pay off. Oof, oof, the slippery slope there, dangerous, especially for these times. I mean, there's this, look, one, I'll say, yes, we should all strive to live righteous first. But I think Matthew 6, 3, 3 is, is very prophetic in its, in its wording. And I know many of my Protestant scripture, uh, scripture, scripture uh, uh, Christians um, will, will appreciate this. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not find it. Seek it. And it kind of speaks to the fallen nature of us all. And that while we try and seek righteousness, it's, it's not proper to allow ourselves to be bullied or, or, or come under tyrannical uh, uh, governance because we, are, we have not yet found that righteousness. That's, that's inappropriate. It's an inappropriate read of Christianity and scripture. And, I, and I'll say this as well, uh, the, the real danger that we're living under, the soft coup of communism has weaponized democracy itself. That's why we hear all the communists reference democracy and their attempts to be tyrannical against us. They want to tell us that if you get any sizable majority to agree on something, then it must mean that it's morally right. That's completely inappropriate as well. We see tons of examples where uh, a massive majority can come together under wickedness and corruption. Uh, and not, not, not a symbol of individuals, uh, of you know, spiritual failures. I mean, all out conspiring to be wicked and corrupt. And so, you know, when, when we say, hey, if there's enough people over on our side where justice and the truth, the truth will win out, I, I see Brett Kavanaugh's example as a, as, a, um, as a miracle shot, that he was not, not only that he became a Supreme Court justice, but that he wasn't brought up on real legal charges uh, and, and, and brought down completely. I see that as, as the ex- exception, not the rule. The rule is men every day, like Trevor Bauer, for example, are getting completely destroyed, and he has been destroyed by this, he said, financially and professionally, uh, from a woman who was clearly, provably, uh, predatory in, in her sexual politics. So tell me this though, Royce, cause, and look, I, I don't have the answer to this, but there are guys, particularly in St. Louis, we've had unbelievable role models who were high level athletes. Kurt Warner and Adam Wainwright are as big a names in St. Louis as you could find. You could accuse yeah. those guys and no one would believe them. I mean, no one. And so <laughs> the owners would stand by them because I, I actually believe that. There are, there are very few of those guys, and I think you're Correct, because I think sexual immorality runs wild amongst men. I mean, that, that is our biggest struggle for everyone. But there are a few guys you're like, he didn't do that. I'll stake my life on that. He didn't do it. And so once you go down that road, I, that to me is what we're going to have to do to begin to conquer this. Because you have to be bulletproof to start to bring this down. No. No. I love you to death, and, and I get it. We should strive for being bulletproof morally. But, but there is no bulletproof when you're faced with political opponents who are willing to completely make stuff up. You can't be bulletproof. And I think you have a very exaggerated belief in Kurt Warner's reputation. I'm not from St. Louis, but I know how radical feminists work. And the question is not if you can get people to really believe you. The question is, what is the danger? What is the perceived threat of, of standing in the truth uh, pro- uh, economically, politically, uh, professionally, uh, politically? This is the this is the question that that becomes important and many people are not willing to stand in the truth because of the dangers politically economically uh, uh, and, and otherwise socially uh, with a sm- socially with a very small with a very small group of people that stand up and speak out. I mean, if you get 10 women to say Kurt Warner raped them. It, it's not about what people think uh, Kurt Warner is or isn't or what they believe. It's about what they risk by standing with him. And I think a lot of people have been so bastardized in their citizenship and their sovereignty and their daily life that they think of that first. You think the people who have kids are going to risk standing with Kurt Warner if it means they're not going to be able to pay their heat bill? I would say no. I would say I, I would venture to say a lot of people will kill actually. And that's the sign of the moral decay of our country, not Trevor Bauer uh, uh, having sex outside of his marriage. The real decay is that too many times uh, good people stand by and do nothing. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about that Kurt Warner analogy you made and and just for me, and, and I say this seriously, but while also joking, if someone accuses me of sleeping with a porn star, 
I don't want anybody to go, I don't believe that about Jason, unless I deny it. If, if I say I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And, and that's kind of where I'm at. I would need Kurt Warner to say, no, I didn't do that. And then I would believe it. But if, if someone, you know, I can't, there are some people whose word I take that seriously and I want my word to be taken that seriously and that's why I confess to everything that I can. Uh, and, and, and so that when I say, nah, that, that ain't me, I didn't do that. And you know, oh yeah, nah. in 2003, I definitely did that. Uh, in 2023, I, no, I didn't do that. I want people to, I want to be believable. And, and that's where I think me and TJ share some common ground in terms of if you're not willing to live righteously, repent, live transparently, your credibility is at stake and you're less believable and therefore you're less able to actually lead. And so... Yeah. This is the flaw and the hole we have in leadership and all these guys that have attained all this money and power and they're so compromised that that they're it's it's like and, and I want to move on and ask you about Jimmy Butler. But it, yeah. the, the reason I'm willing to uh, stand with Brett Favre and, and t people write me emails and criticize me for. Well, you got Brett Favre on the show. How come you had Brett Favre, blah, 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 blah. And it's because, like, I feel so transparent. And it's like no one's got any dirt on me. So I can stand with Brett Favre and other people. Well, you got Warren Sapp on and blah, or whatever. It's like, I think most people will... Some like I'm a credible, legitimate, somewhat trying to be a high character person, and I'm willing to because of the position I put myself in. I'm just willing to stand by people that others is too dangerous. There's too much to lose, and and you know I've looked around. I've lost a lot of friends uh, over the years, not because I've done anything wrong, just because. You know, my worldview is out of style and it's too hot to be friends with Jason Whitlock. And I'm looking at cowardly men and women just run away from me because, you know, oh, my God, it's hot around Whitlock. And I just would never do that. I, 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 I'm, if I'm in the fire with you, I'm in the fire with you. And so anyway, Royce, I did want to ask you. I don't know. I'm rambling there. I, I did want to ask you about. Have you seen Jimmy Butler, Royce? Uh, yeah, so did you see his emo appearance at the? Uh, le le I think we got a clip actually. Le let's watch. He's got his nails painted. He's got his hair did. Uh, do, we, do we have a video here? Let's watch the video. Like the whole lip ring is what I'm doing. Look, 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 look. I gotta stand. Shit, we get a haircut. So uh, that's Jimmy Butler, and, and I want to get out in front of this before I turn it over to you, Royce, because the chats right now and the comments are going, Whitlock, you won't rip Dwayne Wade, but you're going to rip, you're going to criticize Jimmy Butler. And again, this is me just being transparent and just like being honest with you. I done told y'all I got a soft spot for Dwayne Wade. And and I'm just, so don't expect objective, transparent thoughts from me on Dwayne Wade. I, I, I just, I liked his NBA career. I liked the way he honors his dad. I feel sorry for him. I think he's controlled by a witch, in my opinion. I apologize for saying that, Dwayne, but that is what I think. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm just, don't look for me to be ripping Dwayne Wade. You can get it elsewhere. There's no shortage of people ripping Dwayne Wade. You don't need it from me. I like the guy and feel sorry for him. I don't like what we're seeing here from Jimmy Butler. Again, yeah. I looked at it, and I was I just, just another example of just, men, we've just fallen. We, we just, we have no honor. Your, your thoughts? I never liked Jimmy Butler, personally. I never liked him.
since the beginning. I think a lot of his uh, bravado and the competitive nature is uh, he wins by default because there's a general lack of competitive nature from his from his peers across the entire NBA. And that's that's not a knock on them so much individually. It's just the culture of basketball is is much different from a competitive standpoint. Much of that has been done by the changes in the rules uh, to, to intentionally make it anti-competitive from an anti-competitive NBA hierarchy. But uh, who, by the way, loves to see Jimmy Butler dress like this and, and, and show up like this. Uh, the soft coup is working. Um, I never liked Jimmy Butler. I think he's soft. I think he's hard and tough around people who don't really uh, like that type of, of, of controversy and conflict. And he gets passed off through social media as, as some type of tough guy. Tough guys don't show up and, and act like that. Tough guys don't do things like that. They just don't. Um, so if anything, I think I think his rep- reputation should be wounded. But hey, if he can come out and score 37 points still, everybody who's a radical materialist uh, will say, hey, you know, no problem. Fair play to him. Let him dress how he wants. Let him do what he wants. His position in the NBA and in basketball and in the culture has no bearing on the rest of us, the young black men who, who face a, um, a 50% lifetime chance of, of contracting HIV if they uh, engage in a gay lifestyle. Jimmy Butler has no effect on that, yet I shouldn't listen to Donald Trump because he invokes hate from all the white supremacists all around the world. You can't make this up. I mean, the illogic, the illogic in it is, is uh, astounding. But I never liked Jimmy Butler. He's a sellout. I will say um, that, you know, to me, you know, Dwayne Wade, that's his big homie. So it makes sense. Oh, God. Why, uh, you were doing a great job, Royce. Why, why do you got to bring Dwayne Wade into it? Anyway. Knock it in. That's his, that's his big you, homie. That, that's I, his big homie. I just want to ask a question. Is it worth him, average? Him, he's, he's him, said score 37 points. Him, D. Wade, Gabriel worth- Union, they're all in the back, speakeasy, uh, you know, uh, paddling each other. I don't know what they're into. That's all speculation and rumor. I, go yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it is. Um, yeah. He said score 37 points. Is it even worth averaging 37 points if they have a picture of you like that for the rest of your life? <laughs> I'm just telling you, it, a grown man. He just enhanced his brand. He'll probably yes. get all kinds of endorsements and yeah. jersey sales. He's got to live with himself still. Yeah, I, I got it. But the way the world is rigged, he's about to financially benefit from that. I don't care about that. You no, gotta, no, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I know no, we no. don't, but... You know, what I'm saying is, you got a lot of money. You know money doesn't fix it. So, you still got to live with yourself. You still got to go. You're still... He's you, got bigger he's, problems than me. Yeah. And so... I don't, money doesn't, the level of problems I have or whatever, or just money doesn't even make them less pain for whatever. Money, I think, does solve the pain, or in his mind, solve some of the pain that he's going through. Wasn't this, didn't his family abandon him, his real parents abandon him, Mm -hmm. or whatever? And so that type stuff makes me a tiny bit sympathetic. But I'm looking at, if this were 10 years ago, I don't think he would be doing this. The culture is rewarding guys for doing this. This is a a humiliation ritual that they all go through. Uh, You know, again, it's why they, they, and I said I was going to make it all show without saying Dion, but they got him doing like a virgin in a Madonna dress or whatever. There's there's like a, a, a rite of passage you go through for this celebrity and endorsement and brand world, and Jimmy Butler's just hopped on the hopped on the bandwagon. Don't buy it. You don't need it. You're in Miami. You're a, you you just took the Miami Heat with no good players on it to the finals last year. You don't need it. They what? won in the cult, man. You don't. And, and there, there's something about. Whatever, yeah. th- that's what you just don't want to ever get rear ended, TJ, because once you get rear ended, th- it does something to your brain. That's all I can think of with these guys. They got rear ended at a party doing drugs, probably somewhere, and it, they've been nuts yeah. ever since. I disagree with your premise that money fixes it, though. I, I'm just. In his mind, I don't, in his mind, it, all, if he makes enough money, if he does this, it's no different than guys thinking, the more women that I have slept with, it makes me more of a man. It's a false belief. It's an endless pit, but guys fall into that mentality. And when you have the kind of holes that he does 
from whatever happened with his parents and all that, and however he was treated growing up as a kid, he's trying to cover up them holes with money and adulation and celebrity, and, and that's how you end up uh, with your hair pressed and processed and nails done and lip earring and emo. Roy's final thought, well, I've, I've gone, Steve Kim's gonna be mad at me, I'm going too long, but go ahead, Roy's final thought. Without um, mentioning Dwayne Wade, please. Well, well, one, I'm not going to take any of this slander that there's any false equivalency between men who have had uh, a successful sexual uh, lifestyle and 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 uh, the homosexuals that get rear-ended. There's a big pause on that. I'm not I'm not uh, associating with those people in any in any way. Uh, my 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 caution is is this. You know, it's strange to me to see people make the case that culture shouldn't impact behavior. Um, and, and in fact, you know, when you look at the World Economic Forum and what their policies are doing, or like Larry Fink, who's the, the you know, CEO of, of BlackRock saying that we can force behavior, we're going to force behavior. It's a sign that, that culture um, affects behavior. And, you know, the Gen Zers are at about a 20% clip of identifying as LGBTQIA plus elemental P. Uh, and the previous generation was 2%. I mean, an 18% increase in a generation of identifying as LGBTQ is almost proof positive that culture and institutions do uh, affect people's behavior. And, you know, our Christian brothers and sisters better get, better get real serious and real clear about their, their need to be active in the world. Uh, because we've taken a back seat. We've become too focused on us. There's a reason why Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables. It wasn't just because those people were corrupt. It was because they were the spiritual leaders of the of the area. And, and them being in that position and being corrupt allowed them to mislead people spiritually. And there was a se more severe degree uh, 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 before the eyes of God in, in, that, in that respect. Um, and the last thing I'll say about Jimmy Butler is this. If he had come out with a slack one pocket and a button up shirt and some and some gaiters, I would have maybe thought differently about it because there was a time when when some uh, some pimps from the neighborhood from that that time period wore their hair processed like that. But he said, I'm emo. So that that killed it. I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not promoting the pimping. But there were some cool dudes in the 70s like Superfly who wore their hair processed. This ain't that look. Uh, Royce, uh, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, guys, I want to talk to you a little bit about Samaritan Ministries. Tired of someone else telling you where to go when you have a medical need? Are you ready to take control of your health care? Samaritan Ministries could be the solution you're looking for. They connect hundreds of thousands of Christians across the nation who come together through prayer, encouragement, and financial support when a medical need arises. It's not insurance, and you're not limited by restrictive networks. Say you have a medical need. You don't have to check and see what hospital is in your network or be concerned about the doctor being in network too. No, you go to the hospital, you choose, and don't give a second thought as to what's in network and what's not because Samaritan Ministries, you're in control of your health care. Afterwards, fellow members pray for you and send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills. And when they have a medical need, you'll do the same for them. That's what biblical health care sharing looks like. Check it out today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. I got a great email last week from a guy who's a part of Samaritan Ministries. Thank me for referencing him. Talked to him. Said he's been involved with them for 10 years and it's going great. Check him out. Uh, you can email me and us, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Uh, the star of the show, uh, Steve Kim, Korean Cosell, next. Hello, Fearless Army, and welcome to another edition of Shaking My Headlines. I'm your host, Shamika Michelle, and this is where we discuss a few hot topics that caused me to shake my head. Mm, mm, mm. Where do I begin? 
Last week, Jada Bell Pinkett Smith took another trip around the sun. In honor of her, Will Smith posted a beautiful birthday tribute. In honor of herself, Jada Bell posted an old video of her and her husband, Tupac. Now, after a little backlash, when it came to Willard's birthday this week, Jada Bell posted a beautiful birthday tribute to him, letting Will know that although you're an afterthought, you're a thought nonetheless. Fans of Remy Ma and Papoose, the black love couple, are on the edge of their seats. They're trying to figure out, has Remy dissed her loyal husband for a 25-year-old no-name? As many of you remember, Papoose stood by Remy when she was sentenced to eight years in prison. Sources say, if Remy Ma is cheating on Papoose, not only is she grimy, not only is she low down, but she's a man. As men do this every day across the country. In other rap news, funky Doberman pincher face Snoop Dogg had a message for Trump supporters. The man who can't go a full 24 hours without a mood altering, mind altering drug wanted to let Trump supporters know if you vote for Trump again, you're a stupid mf -er. Don't vote for that nigga, please don't. Look what he do. He just don't give a fuck. Y'all, honest, blue collar, hard working people and suffering. So if he don't care about y'all, he really don't give a fuck about us. So fuck him too. And fuck everybody down with Donald Trump. I said it, yeah, Snoop Dogg, fuck, fuck him. Now, sources say, the video is actually old, a resurfaced video from 2019. However, Shamika says that after years of munching on the old gnarled crusted corns of Martha Stewart, and after three joke pokes, you know, the noose juice, Snoop is liable to say anything. So I forgive him. In other words, Snoop, we forgive you little fella. You don't know any better. Now for a bit of world news. The internet was in a frenzy as Brooke Brooke Jackson was named Miss Universe Zimbabwe 2023. Sources say that her acceptance speech recited this poem. Roses are red, this decision's tragic cause I abracadabra and hocus pocus and whitewashed your black girl magic. Last but not least, oops, Britney Spears did it again. Unfortunately, what's the it you ask? She posted another video of herself dancing around in tiny panties, this time with knives. Guys, I can't help but wonder, how did Britney go from being this top pop star to being shaped like a club cracker and leaving those of us who protested free Britney rather see that bird in a cage? Anyway, I'm Shamika Michelle. Join me for the next time you leave me shaking my headline. All right, the champ is here. The champ is here. Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell, the star of the show, the man you guys have all been waiting for all day, uh, all evening. Steve, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, you're from, you live out in Los Angeles. You're a tiny bit of a Dodgers fan, I would imagine. Uh, wanted your thoughts on Trevor Bauer. Oh, you're not a Dodgers fan. No, no, no. A Angels, Angels fan? Mm -hmm. No. When they got rid of Garvey in uh, 1982, as a young kid whose American name is actually, actually named after him, they died to me. I know how the 
folks in Brooklyn felt when the Dodgers, when them bums left for the West Coast. I'm a hard man, Jason. I stick to my principles. But by the way, Jason, I just want to point out to the audience, great not seeing you this past weekend at Football Palooza. I look forward to you not showing up again this week. But anyway, keep going. Keep going. There's a chance. There's, I, go? I think there's a better chance of me coming oh, this yeah. week than there was last okay. week. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Book the ticket, yeah. Steve. Yeah, I st- it's already paid for. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, Steve, uh, your thoughts on Trevor Bauer? I believe that he needs to be almost a martyr, and it's almost happening on Twitter now. But, you know, there's going to be a lot said about his own behavior, uh, that of the woman that of Major League Baseball and the Dodger organization. The specific point that I'd like to make here is that the corporate legacy media or the liberal industrial or media industrial complex, they are complicit in this crime that took place. And I do believe it is a crime. And um, specifically, quote, unquote, journalists like Molly Knight, who wrote stories it came out that she had some information and she flat out lied about it. Now, you want to wonder why we call this fake news and why trust in the media is at an all-time low. Right there, Jason. Right there. Uh, Instead of actually being unbiased uh, reporters who wait for the facts and then disseminate the proper information, there's this rush to either be an advocate or, and I hate this term, being on the right side of history or an agenda. And I I actually think that writers like Molly Knight are as big a story as uh, Mr. Bauer here. This is probably something they taught you in journalism school. Can they, if she knew and wrote the opposite, can they sue her for libel? They should be able to, yes. Uh, I think he did sue her and Deadspin and maybe the cases got tossed out, I, I can't remember. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me with the agenda-driven news cycle and, and all of that. It, it, it's, do you think Trevor Bauer is pitching in the major leagues next season? You know, I don't know. There's such a stain on his name, whether that's fair or not. It reminds me uh, in, in a little way, I don't know if it's perfectly analogous, of that young punter from San Diego State, Ariza who was railroaded by false allegations. And once again, the mainstream corporate legacy media jumped to conclusions, wrote their stories before they had the real facts or just chose not to really expose them. Although HBO Real Sports did a story on them to their credit. And I don't see that young man punting for anyone in the National Football League. Unfortunately, in today's society, not only are you guilty till you are proven innocent, once you are then proven innocent, I still don't know if you can get away from the stench of the actual accusations that are at play. Steve, I want to move on to something that happened in broadcasting. I think speaks to the <sighs> speaks even more to the phoniness of the media and just where we're at. Rodney Harrison tried to bait Chiefs defensive tackle Chris Jones into trashing Zach Wilson. Let's watch the tape. Was Zach better tonight than what you anticipated he would be watching him on tape? And you could be honest. Um, Honestly, uh, if I'm being completely honest, we knew it was going to be a battle. He's continued to get better week in and week out. And he's continued to lead week in and week out. But watching that tape, man, you got to look at this dude and say, oh, he is garbage. Like, we should we should really tear him apart. But tonight he came on and played extremely well against you guys. Yeah, he played really well. Is that <laughs> – people tend to forget he's a first-round quarterback. Second pick overall, yeah. Number two. Yeah. And that kid is special. You know, yeah. um, like I said, Zach Wilson is special, man. You just got to give the guy time. You know what I wait, mean? Wait, 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 wait. Did you say Zach Wilson is special? Yeah. I think he had a special night, but I don't think he's special. I've got to prove that over. You're special because you proved it over a course of time. He's not special. I'm just saying, Chris. Hey, listen. I'm just saying. Bro. I'm a Zach Wilson fan. I'm a Zach I'm Wilson fan. I'm not saying I'm not. I like the kid. I, I, I think with time, you can, he, he can show you his ability. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts on Rodney Harrison's behavior? Well, a couple things. It's obviously Chris Jones got paid and he's happy. 
I mean, just, just to stay above the fray. But you know what? Rodney Harrison's always been a bit of a cheap shot artist. That has been the reputation. And obviously that hasn't changed. But I will say this. I think he issued some sort of apology. My view is, why don't you stand on your word? If you think he's trash and garbage, just say, you know what? That's my opinion. I'm not changing for it. You don't have to like my wording, but that's what I said. Stand on it. I can respect that. Secondly, it has to be asked. Let's say that NBC put through the put us through, and I'm talking about America, the unfortunate happenstance. Let's say the Bears were on national TV and we were stuck with that game. Oh, God, that's punishment, right? And Justin Fields had one of his bad games, even though he was pretty good this week. Let's say he had one of those Justin Field games. 14 for 32, 138 yards, an interception or two, no t- And the other team that won, let's say their version of Chris Jones, I, I just, again, I'm going to go there. I'm going to ask it. Would he say, man, Justin Fields is horrendous. That boy is garbage. Are you surprised he played as bad as he did? Would he, you, I mean, honestly, do you think he would do that if it was a Justin Fields? No. I don't, okay, I'm not just saying. No. Yeah. No, and that that is where... And, and Rodney Harrison's getting piled on by everybody, NFL players, media, everybody's piling on him. But no one wants to point the finger of blame. But like, who created the environment where he thought that that was appropriate? And to me, this is what ESPN and Fox Sports and all the nonstop debate shows, they created this environment, and Rodney Harrison just fell into the bait. It's like, oh, we got a white quarterback. We can say whatever we want. We can trash him. It's even a good look if we trash him and go over the top. And, and we know that as it relates to black quarterbacks and black athletes, we have to deal with them with kid gloves and, and travel very, you know, carefully. It, 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 it's, I'm going to make a prediction. I don't think Rodney Harrison's going to recover from this, and this will be his last year on Sunday oh. Night Football. Uh, I don't know. I just, that's a tough one. But I'm going to reiterate my point. I would actually have a lot more respect for old Rodney if he just said, I said what I said. Here's my flag. I'm planting it. I'm not changing. Uh, honestly. Well, he's uh, also. Go ahead, TJ. Go ahead. He's not, yeah, he's not Charles Barkley. Meaning, he, Charles would do this to whoever and just say, that is what it is. <laughs> Look, he sucks. I don't know what to tell you. He's terrible, Shaq. What do you think, right? Rodney, but it, it goes somewhat to your point of the soft bigotry of low expectations, right? Well, the black kids couldn't handle it, so we'll never criticize him like that. Zach Wilson, he's bad. We'll just tell the truth. And if he's any good, he'll get up and handle it like a man. That is accurate. It, 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 it's, it's unfortunate that, we, that, that they've allowed this environment to be created because where they're, everybody's going to go with this is, as an athlete, never criticize another athlete. That's going to be the takeaway. That, that's kind of the messaging. How <laughs> dare you, as an athlete, criticize another athlete? And so what we're going to is just like everybody's going to be on air just worshiping athletes. And, no, and again, because the, the whole garbage thing or whatever, that's so beneath a former professional athlete. Because oh. you're expecting a level of expertise and commentary from them that should be at a higher level than just what you would get off of Twitter. That's a Twitter comment. It's That's, locker room talk too, though. That is exactly what you'd say to your other safeties. But this Jason, guy's garbage. We should each have three picks this week. Yeah. Can we That's be true. honest? And TJ, you mentioned it on Twitter on your timeline on Sunday as Wilson in that second half started dotting guys up, throwing lasers, I, I think all of America was like, oh, what, 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 what's going on here? I, I, my eyes turned around. I was like, whoa, Zach Wilson? Really? I, I mean, it was, it was surprising because we all had the same thought. Who is this guy? Who got into his uniform? Where did you put the real Zach Wilson? And, and you're talking about athletes being honest with one another. Guys, I saw – a non-fight on pay-per-view <laughs> on Saturday night between Canelo Alvarez and Jermel Charlo, who put on one of the worst non-efforts I've ever seen. And it's one thing for guys like me or fans to catcall and 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 disparage Charlo, 
But a lot of fighters, pro fighters, namely Terrence Crawford, flat out said, you were garbage tonight. You were so bad. I don't even have you on my hit list anymore. You embarrassed yourself. <laughs> and he was not the only one. So again, Jason, do we want that blunt honesty or not? But I think the bigger question is, are we going to have that for everybody? Is it the same standard that that will apply to every single player or performer? No, it will not apply to every single player and performer. This was interesting. I found more interesting in the media space, uh, Steve. uh, And this happened, I think, a week or so ago. Dan Lebitard... uh, made a comment that I completely agree with, that Stephen A. Smith and Shannon Sharp are trying to end Skip Bayless's career. Let's play that clip. About the war at the top of this industry between Skip Bayless and his protege. Because if you think Woj and Shams have a rivalry, Stephen A. Smith wants to end Skip Bayless's career, took his guy, and I told you when this happened, Shannon Sharp is more valuable to Skip at this point than Skip is to Shannon. Now, Shannon's an individual entity. Club Shay Shay teams up with Colin Cowherd because he realizes, wait a minute, my brand is strong enough, I don't need the networks. I can make my own business. This is what Stephen A. Smith is doing with his production company and with power. He gets Shannon Sharp now and every time on first take, and this is so good, what is under Shannon Sharp every time he's talking is three-time Super Bowl champion, five-time Pro Bowler, greatest tight end ever, just credentials, respect. Why did he leave Skip? Why did Shannon Sharp leave Skip Bayless in a successful partnership? Because respect was lost on the day that Skip Bayless said to Shannon Sharp's face, Your career pales, as an insult, pales compared to Tom Brady's. Hmm. So I I think Levitard is right here in terms of Skip Bayless and, I mean, uh, Stephen A. Smith, all this phony baloney. Skip is like a brother to me, and, you know, I'm just so respectful and thankful towards Skip. It's all phony baloney. He and Shannon Sharp are trying to destroy Skip, and they're doing it with racial politics. And, and, and basically, that, that's why they put out the videos of, of almost beat up Skip over what, whatever it was, the Mar Hamlin thing, or I wanted to put my hands on him, took all of my power. Yeah, it's when, the, you know, when, when, Sh- when Skip said, you know, Tom Brady's better than you, blah, blah, blah. They're trying to destroy Skip Bayless. So Stephen A. Smith, I think in the last 24, 48 hours, he's responded to Dan Levitard's take. Let's play that. But that brings me to the second point and the bigger point, which is why I wanted to address. I have never been. I am not. Nor will I ever be at war with Skip Bayless. Mm. That will not happen. Trying to be number one is an entirely different agenda than trying to end somebody's career. I hope and pray that Skip Bayless is on TV doing what he loves to do and talking sports for as long as he wants to do it. Do I want to beat him? Yes. Mm. I want to beat anybody I'm going up against. That includes you, Dan. Hmm. Mm. Uh, the proxy war. Your, th- y- your yeah, thoughts. Mean, you know, I think they both have a point, but this is a, a battle. It's a war. All's fair in love and war and morning television ratings with debate shows. And I get the sense that maybe Sharp, Mr. Sharp wants to end Skip. Stephen A, I don't think his feelings are as harsh. He just wants to be number one. But if I was going to make this into an analogy, I kind of do this once in a while. This is kind of like an artist who was at Bad Boy Records or was very friendly with the East Coast, but then went over to Death Row Records. You know, maybe like uh, Tupac, by the way. I guess they finally found the shooter. took long enough. I don't know if that really affects any of us. So maybe... This is kind of like Bad Boy and Death Row, right? 
and I don't know who would be Tupac. I don't know. I hope nobody gets shot, by the way. And so now this becomes a rivalry. I actually think both guys are correct. But in my view, Stephen A. Smith, he just wants to be number one. I Look, when you are a competitor, Coke and Pepsi, McDonald's or Burger King, there's always going to be a natural rivalry. And by the way, given the ages of everyone involved, Skip Bayless is much closer to the end of his career than the beginning or even the prime. That's the reality. I don't like the bad boy death row analogy just because this is such a one-sided battle right now that Stephen A is so far out ahead of Skip Bayless (laughs) that it's just that analogy just doesn't work. Wait a minute. You don't think it's like Suge A. Smith thing. Hey, everybody, you all up. I want to have a producer or a co-host all up in your videos telling you to keep your glasses on. Y'all come over here to death row, right? You don't, you don't, think, it's a, you don't think it's analogous at all? Not even close? Oh, God, I've had better ones. I, that I've had is, but again, <laughs> Bad Boy was putting out you know, popular music at the time. They were in competition with... Hold with on. death row, I mean. Do they even know uh, what we're talking about? I hear him laughing. Is this just going right over TJ's head? I don't want to stereotype. Oh, I don't TJ- know anything about death row. I know Skip is sitting there and he's been a punching bag for a year or two. <laughs> yeah, Skip yeah. is more vanilla ice uh, <laughs> than Puffy. I will say, Steve. I- Hung over the balcony? Oh, I- man, that was bad when that happened. <laughs> that, that's what Shannon Sharp is <laughs> hanging Skip Bayless out over a balcony. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm surprised you think uh, Stephen A just be, needs to be number one. He has pounded Max Kellerman into the ground on his way out the door over and over again. And every time he gets an opportunity to talk about why Max Kellerman was terrible, he seizes on it. He's done the same thing with Skip. They've gone back and forth to their feud, who was, in, who was really responsible for their success. So I, he's made a habit of going after his old co-host, and that seems a little more personal. Max Kellerman's a threat to absolutely no one. Steve? I Jason, think that's I an a, excellent point. I have a theory about the whole Max Kellerman, Stephen A. breakup and why Stephen A. Smith jettisoned him and is now piling on him. And I think people have completely missed it. They've never brought it up. Uh, but that's why the old Kimsters brought out of the bullpen like Dennis Eckersley. The reason why I think that they had friction and, and that Stephen A. Smith wanted no part of this guy had nothing to do with his qualifications or anything else or even really – the way he was personally. I don't think they had an issue. I believe Stephen A. Smith got sick of the liberal, white guilt, pro-black pandering of Max Kellerman. Because if you really think about it, Stephen A. Smith is much more conservative leaning than anyone ever thought. And I'm sure you've had a lot of white friends, Jason, that always tell you things that you think you want to hear. Like, oh my God, this white supremacy must really hurt you, Jason. And you're kind of thinking, uh been okay to me this country and then finally one of the breaking points is when terrell owens you know the old yes. brother man says hey max man you know you got more street cred and Stephen a's just thinking hold up hold up because i because i know guys like this they're like uh max you live in a white gated community like i do okay except i'm actually black i don't have to go around and pander and and do all this other stuff and i think he got sick of that whole thing being shoved in his face because i think Stephen a smith in his own mind is saying Bro, get off it. Get off it. Because I, I remember distinctly when Max was doing his radio show with your old co-host, Marcellus Wiley. That show almost, to me, was unlistenable because the few times that I'd be on the dial, on the freeway, uh, Max would always overtalk Marcellus. He would just dominate the conversation. And then in the middle of football season, he wouldn't let Marcellus talk football. And meanwhile, he's focusing in on Mike Trout uh, on base percentage. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, Max, nobody wants to talk baseball in the middle of October. Let Marcellus break down the 4-3, please. And I would just go click onto my Debbie Deb DVD or CD, Lisa Lisa. I could not take it anymore. And I'm just telling you, it was Max's whole thing about wanting to have the perma invite to the cookout and to be down that I think after a while just really got on Stephen A. Smith's last nerve. Agree or disagree, but that's my theory. 
You know he's right. That was the greatest moment of Max Kellerman's life when T.O. told him he was black. He's, that he's never been happier. You should have seen the look on his face. Damn. So, obviously, Damn. I know all parties involved. <laughs> uh, obviously, I, I was friendly with Max Kellerman. And, and so, I'll, I'll say this. I think you're 99% right. I, oh. I'll put a slightly, a tiny yeah. different twist on it. I, I'm not going to say the name of the executive, but 15 years ago, and again, I was friendly with Max, and because Max was friendly with everybody in the media, but particularly the black guys. And you know, Max, uh, as a kid, was a rapper, and and you know, a pretty decent rapper. Uh, he and his brother, and and you know, Max's brother got murdered, by, I think, by a boxer or whatever. And Max has a very interesting, yeah, has a James very Butler. interesting story. And, you know, I've been to Max's house, met his wife and kids. Me and Max were friendly. And and there was conversations between me and Max, just general, not anything specific about doing something together. An executive at ESPN, who I will not name, told me, no, don't don't you ever do a show with Max Kellerman. He's going to... He's going to spend the entire show trying to prove to the audience that he's blacker than you, and it's going to annoy you. (laughs) And uh, that's where I think you're right, and I think that where where Stephen A. with that Terrell Owens situation is, if, if he and Max are truly partners, Stephen A. really doesn't have to say anything in that situation. Max Kellerman jumps in, and says, what? What did you just say, Terrell? No, nah, cut it out, man. You know, blacker than me, you know, blah, 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 blah. He, he corrects Terrell Owens and that level of stupidity on the spot. Instead, Stephen A had to do it and was left kind of out on an island. And I'm sure that violated the partnership between those two. And Stephen A found out the hard way that th- that is kind of what gets Max's rocks off, for lack of a better description, going on TV and showing everybody how black he is or how black he thinks he is. And and I say this not as saying I have no affinity for Max or I'm I'm looking to badmouth Max, but but it is an area where Max needs to grow up and and just be a man. And and now I'm really going to say something dangerous or whatever, but again. Here we go. That white Jewish liberal who thinks he knows better than black people, Mm. what's good for black people, what's best for black people, that's Max Kellerman. Mm. And and I say that without, I'm not trying to be harsh. I would say it to Max's face. I, I, I believe it. That's where he needs some growth. Come up out of this childish or superior thinking of, of like, no, I, I know what's, how black people should really think. That whole, air, that's what's at the root of Stephen A. Smith's problem with Max Kellerman. You know, Stephen A., in my view, should man up and say that rather than take subtle shots that are difficult for people to read through the lines. But yeah, that would be very annoying uh, for, for T.O. and then basically to have your white partner kind of halfway co-sign what T.O. is saying. So I, I do want to get back to one thing, though, as it relates to Skip Bayless, uh, Steve. Skip Bayless, to me, is operating and acting as if his career is hanging by a thread. And that's why Dan Lebatard is saying, like, man, they're trying to destroy him because anybody with a pair of eyes and common sense can see like, oh my God, Skip Bayless is desperate. Here's a 70 year old man pretending to be best friends with Lil Wayne, 70 year old white man. But you just take color out of it. There shouldn't be any legitimate 70 year old man of any accomplishment that should be like, oh, I'm best friends with a 38 year old rapper whose whole face is tatted up. Who, 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 so th- that speaks to Skip's level. I think they got some kind of gold chain 
looking deal that's like the undisputed brand now. And they, Lil Wayne came up with a new rap song, Skip Every Friday, Where's a Gold Chain? Skip is out here just dead. Oh, black people, please love me. Shannon Sharp has made y'all hate me. Stephen A. Smith is making y'all hate me. Black people, please love me. To the point that they took that whole undisputed crew to Boulder, Colorado last week to have Deion Sanders lay hands on Skip Bayless. And, and it's like, Lil Wayne ain't enough. I got to have Deion co-sign that I'm good. I got, I got a pass to the cookout. Let's play this clip. Yeah, hold on for one second. Right. Thank you, man. Thanks. Because you get heat oftentimes. I do. But you've given a lot of us opportunities that people look past and Thank they don't you. understand, right. they don't recognize it. And none of us are perfect. But you have given us, y'all know darn well what I'm talking about, so many opportunities, man. And I appreciate you for that, boss. Yeah. Straight up, Skip. Thank you, you for saying man, man. Thank you. Thank you. I love you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hmm. So <laughs> what I would like to ask Dion is define a lot. And, and you know, this, hmm. I don't know if, again, Skip's not taking undiscovered kids out of the ghetto, uh, kids that barely grab, you know, I, I, I the whole thing. Is and, and again, I don't want to beat up Skip because I don't think Skip's a bad guy. I think again, I, I think that he's trying to survive, and this whole morning debate show industry is built around. I'm sorry for saying this, but it's factual. It's built around in their minds appealing to unemployed black men who are at home at that time that have nothing to do, and so. Hey, Lil Wayne's my BFF. We play rap music here. I interview rappers. I bring on black athletes to talk. This is the show. He, he's Skip is playing some racial game that I guess he feels he has to play in order to get ratings. It's embarrassing. It, it, it's to be this kind of desperate and to have, have to have Dion, and Dion's gonna come on and co-sign Skip. Skip's gonna use his show to cover up and, and, and cheerlead for Dion. This is a, pre, a quid pro quo going on that's embarrassing, I think, for both parties. Your thoughts, Steve? Well, like I said earlier, Skip feels the heat. He has seen the social media blowback over how the situation with Shannon Sharp played out. It was kind of messy. He came out on the short end of the stick. He is now fighting for survival in what is the very late fourth quarter of his career. And look, he's addicted to being on camera. He loves his work. I, I don't think he wants to retire gracefully. Retirement has killed more people than work. That's the sense that I get with Skip Bayless. I think it's actually admirable. So, yes, he is fighting to survive and fighting for his relevancy. But is there a level of pandering? Of course there is. I mean, Jason, I halfway expect next week he's going to come out in a FUBU jacket and a Koofy. <laughs> or a Pell or a Nietzsche. Bat Farm. I don't know. I've I, I, I kind of, like, forgotten all that. But anyway, he'll wear one of that stuff with, like, I don't know, maybe go back to baggy jeans and Timberlands. Now, that would be something. Now, now Skip came out to Timberlands and baggy jeans and a beanie cap. You know what? I'd be like, you know, Skip, you're taking this all the way to the limit. We're good. But yes, there is a level of pandering, Jason. Yes. He may drop his wife and, and marry Pam Greer. Or <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I can define a lot for you. You said how many opportunities a lot. More than Dion's given. Both his coordinators are white. <laughs> Ooh, oh, jeez. That is the truth. Oh, and okay. that little blessing from Dion came at a price because on Friday, Skip came out and said he'd take Shadour number one over Caleb Williams. <sighs> Good pro quo indeed. You know, you know what's funny about that take? Uh, I'm not. I left that game not sure if I'm on Caleb, if I'm on Team Caleb Williams. Oh, me too. Uh, Can't throw the deep ball, but I'm yeah. telling you, I wouldn't take Shadur over him today. Dude's not coming today. off a of Heisman. I got it, but I don't. One of them. Uh, 
I don't know what I don't know what I think about that. I got to see more from Shadour in later in the season before I'm willing to go there. But uh, Steve, uh, thank you so much. Uh, great job as always. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, uh, guys. I want to tell you about one of the easiest uh, endorsements I have to give: Liver Health Formula. You guys know I've been fighting my fatty liver and fighting the battle of the bulge. Started taking Liver Health Formula two years ago. Six months ago, they hopped on board as a sponsor for this show, unbeknownst to me. What more of an authentic recommendation could I give you than Liver Health Formula? Uh, a fatty liver, you're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those without it. The American Heart Association estimates that like 100 million Americans are dealing with a fatty liver. Liver Health Formula can help you fight that. It's been helping me. It's got 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. Your liver's been doing all kinds of stuff for you, all kinds of stuff. Why not help your liver? So I need to get you guys to try Liver Health Formula. Here's how you do it. Uh, you go to <clears throat> try, I'm sorry, get liverhelp.com slash Jason. That's Get liverhelp.com slash Jason. Use my promo code or use that uh, getliverhelp.com slash Jason. You get your free bottle of, of a blood sugar deal that will help you control your blood sugar. Get liverhelp.com slash Jason. Brett Favre, the fun slinger. Next. Abortion Worse Than Slavery, previously on Fearless. I hope one day I make it to heaven and I'm able to ask God, and maybe there is no degree, maybe no, neither is worse than the other, but from my perspective, abortion is worse than slavery. And I say that because we have this mentality. Well, that's, that that's an easy one. The founding, <laughs> yeah, the founding fathers were the worst people in the world, and and oh my God, they had slavery. And I'm like, well, hold on, man. We got abortion basically on demand, and we got people out in the streets having convulsions. I can't kill my baby whenever I want to. And I'm like, man, I can't wait to, for God to to make a ruling on this. They're like. No, I think this abortion thing's worse than slavery. A am I wrong for thinking that? Um, you, you know, my ancestors were slaves, um, but I'm here. If my mother had had an abortion, <laughs> I wouldn't be. Um, so, yeah, you get no argument from me on that one. All right, welcome back. Time for some fun slinging with Brett Favre. Talk a little NFL football with one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. TJ, let's roll out to Mississippi and bring in uh, our QB legend. Uh, Brett, uh, I'm going to start with Zach Wilson and the New York Jets. They lost to the Kansas City Chiefs, but it looks like all the pressure and all the criticism is, is finally kind of lit a fuse with Zach Wilson. He's, he's showing signs of life. What, what do you think you saw Sunday night? I saw the same thing. I saw a team that very well could have beat the Chiefs and came close. Um, Zach Wilson has, has gotten his share of criticism without question, uh, rightfully so. Um, well, there's a lot of factors. I don't, I don't know the, uh, Zach. Um, I haven't watched a lot of his games. Um, so it's, it's really not fair for me to, to give my opinion. But what, what I've seen and what I, I've definitely have heard and read. And uh, again, I haven't watched much, but a little bit I've seen. It's all been critical, very critical of him. So for him to kind of rise up, and I know it's one game, but for him to rise up, play like, as well as he did against a defending Super Bowl champion, 
uh, I, I'm, I'm like you. I, I want to say he's really kind of turned the corner in a good way. I, and I hope so for, for his sake. Uh, again, I don't know him, but uh, he's, he's gotten a lot. The pressure has mounted immensely on top of him. When I think about him and why I wanted to bring him up to you, because you're right, that the, there's been a ton of criticism. Rodney Harrison uh, is taking some heat for his criticism post game, where you know he he called him garbage, and this is after the guy just played well. But, but the reason I brought, wanted to bring it up to you is because it's it's not that your dad was critical in in the nature of a Rodney Harrison or some of the, but but sometimes criticism can bring out the greatness in you. And and I'm not saying Zach Wilson needed it, but I I, I thought about, you know, Terry Bradshaw was called in early in his career, like the dumbest guy to ever play quarterback. Hollywood Henderson, linebacker, said, Terry Bradshaw couldn't spell cat if he spotted the C and the A. And no one threw a pity party for Terry Bradshaw. He just had to fight through it, and he became an all-time great quarterback. I, I, I think the trial by fire sometimes makes some pretty good bacon. Absolutely. It, it's a double-edged sword. Um, it can go one of two ways. It can light a fire, motivate you, which is what – the Jets hope, um, or you can crumble. Um, you know, we, we talk about Zach Wilson and are critical of him because of where he was drafted. I think he was the third pick in the draft. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason. Uh, but yeah, he was I think very, he was. A very high pick. And um, a lot is expected of you at that position. Regardless of where, if you're the starter for an NFL team at quarterback, there's a lot of pressure on you. And when you're drafted as high as he is, um, there's even more pressure. Then you play bad. You're very, very critical. Uh, The pressure is mounted. So I, I totally agree with you. It can go one of two ways, and it seems to be going in a good way for him. Yeah, and I want to correct both of us. I think he was the second pick overall. but Even but worse. I, I think – yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the way he handled the postgame comments, he, he's a different person than he was when he entered the league. He's taking it more seriously. And so I, 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 I think the other thing I'm seeing is, like, guys around the league are starting to rally – around yeah. him there were Micah Parsons Patrick Mahomes guys around the league are, are starting to support him because now there's some sympathy for him because like everybody's like hey man we've gone a little bit too far with the criticism of, of Zach Wilson and so you know we give up on quarterbacks so quick now and and when you entered the league it wasn't uncommon for guys to sit for two or three years Correct. before they got a chance to start and play they got a chance to mature, get used to having money and freedom and all that other stuff. And, and so I don't think we should be writing off a guy with that much talent to be taken at number two, and he's showing some fight here. Yeah, I, I think for Zach Wilson, for anyone drafted that high, much is expected of you. Uh, much more than, say, Tom Brady, who was, I think, taken in the last round. Uh, not a whole lot is expected of Tom when he got in into play. But Zach Wilson, not only did he get drafted second, he got drafted by the Jets, whether it be the Jets or the Giants. The The media presence is like nothing he's ever seen, especially coming from BYU. Uh, so, yeah. I'm, I'll be honest with you. You know, I thought he played exceptionally well. They could have won that game. But I thought that the pressure and the criticism was going to be too much for him, and he would crumble. Uh, 
nothing against him. I just felt like that it was too much. But you know, so far he's he's proved me wrong, and and that's uh, good for him. A lot of guys, Brett, want to play in a New York or a Los Angeles or a Chicago. They want to play in a major media market. What? For your personality, was Green Bay and kind of the isolation of Wisconsin, was that the right fit for you and your personality? You think early in your career, had you been playing in a major city, things may not have gone as well for you in the NFL? Uh, Very easily could have gone the other way. Uh, Green Bay was a perfect fit for me. First of all, my... All I thought about as a kid up until the time I was drafted was playing pro football. What better place to play, just from a football perspective, what better place to play than Green Bay? Tons of history, tradition, wonderful, great uh, Hall of Fame players. Uh, The town is much like what I grew up in, small town. Very easy traffic wise. I mean, logistically speaking, I, it took me three minutes to get from home to the facility. You know, the, just the ease of it all. I, I enjoyed hunting. I played golf. I got to do both. Um, so, uh, and, and the rapport with the fans was uh, was mutual. Uh, I played. I think like. They lived hard work in blue collar. Um, and so it was a perfect fit for me. Brent, do you think we give up on these guys too quick? One guy that we're seeing right now make a resurgence is Geno Smith. Geno looks really good in Seattle. He was with the Jets. He looked horrible. And he came out. And now having, I mean, it's been five, six, seven years. And he looks like a good quarterback. And, and we won't count Seattle out because of that. Most of these guys today get thrusted in, they get two years, their coach then sees that his job's on the line, so then they just discard a guy. I mean, there was a drive in the second quarter where I thought Zach Wilson made a collection of throws that not very many guys in the NFL can make, five, six, seven guys, back shoulder throws, darts. I mean, he, his touchdown drive in the second quarter, I thought was as good as it gets. But we've casted this guy out, and everybody says, bring Rodgers in. Zach Wilson's no good. Do you think we give up too quickly on these guys, particularly now because they don't get to take the path that Aaron Rodgers did behind you or that Pat Mahomes did behind Alex Smith? They don't get to sit and learn. They just get thrusted in from BYU. Question. Yes. Ask, ask the question. <laughs> yes. Do you, think, do you think we give up on these guys too quickly? Well, yes and no. I mean, take Geno Smith, for, for example. Um, I think it's more um, m- moving to a different – like I, what I see is one team gives up on a guy, another team finds some, like a, um, a diamond in the rough, like Seattle found with Geno Smith. Uh, will that happen with Zach Wilson? Will he stay with the Jets? You, you got to assume that if if he stays, he's going to be a backup eventually when Aaron comes back. If he goes somewhere else, maybe he resurfaces as a uh, you know a quality, maybe even a great player, uh, equal to where his draft status um, was. So I you know. Sometimes I just think it's not the right fit, and which leads me to I scratch my head sometimes where where and what teams are thinking when they draft certain players at certain at, you know third pick in the draft, trading up, giving up you know the farm to trade up, and um, it, it's it's such a gamble. So uh, I think it's more a re- reinvigorated, you know, uh, sometimes it could be with the same team. But in most cases, it's you, you go on to a different place and it's a good fit and it works for you. That, that's where I think 
you're suggesting Geno Smith found the right fit in the right Absolutely. environment, the right coach, more so if he had landed someplace else, it may not have happened for him. Absolutely. But Pete Carroll, with all that experience, it, it's the right fit. Uh, speaking of right and wrong fits, Deshaun Watson goes to the Cleveland Browns where a lot of quarterbacks have gone to die. And, and now... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> some of his teammates, uh, Jadavian Clowney, was rather surprised uh, that Deshaun didn't play this week despite a hurt shoulder. Go back. I want to read this quote. I did not believe he was sitting out even when they told me in this locker room. I was like, man, there's no way they're probably playing with us. That Jadavian Clowney seems to be throwing Deshaun Watson under the bus there. What do you make of that? Um, I, I, I sense the same thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what the dynamics are like in Cleveland. Um, I, I know Kevin Stefanski, we were together in Minnesota. I think a, a lot of him. Um, I don't know what it's like to coach Deshaun. I don't know what it's like to play with him. And it's, uh, again, it's like I said earlier, it's unfair for me to say he should have or could have played. Um, but that question has been posed now with J Jadavion Clowney. Uh, should he or could he have played? Um, and if, if the answer to that is yes, they got problems, but I, I don't know the answer to that, how hurt he was. Well, they're, they're saying he was cleared medically to play, and he chose not to, and, you know, he knows his own body better than everybody else. I, I want to juxtapose that, though, to Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is clearly <clears throat> injured, but he's choosing to play, and his play is really, really suffering. And so there's a balancing act between wanting to be a warrior and a soldier, but not putting yourself out there when you can't play at a high level and you're hurting your team. Is that something Joe Burrow needs to think about and perhaps reconsider? Yes and no. I, I assume that he is, you know, he's a smart guy. Um, I, I, I really feel like in that situation um, where he is, the team he's with, the the personnel, that he gives them the best chance to win, and it, it and it may not be pretty, not right now, but we've sort of seen this before with them. Um, but it, I, I sense a little bit more desperation uh, with each week. So uh, at some point they got to right the ship and and. Joe needs to get healthy, but I, I assume that the, the organization and, and Joe feel like even injured, he gives them the best chance to win. And I, I sort of agree. So we talked last week or the week before about your Iron Man streak, and it was amazing. And you, you said part of it was just out of fear. I didn't want to lose my job. Mm -hmm. What would... What would Brett Favre in his prime or in Joe Burrow's position be if Brett Favre felt like, no, I can play, but the organization, the head coach says, Brett, we want to sit you down uh, because we don't think you're healthy enough or, or you're struggling right now with the injury. H how, would, how would you have handled it if they had asked you to sit when you thought you were healthy enough to play? Well, there were a couple of times where that was the case. Um, and I talked him out of it. You know, for me, I, for whatever reason, I played my best in those situations. And, and not that I was injured, but when my father passed away, I played as good as I could play. When I broke my thumb on my throwing hand, which is something you would assume you're not going to play the next week. And I went to Minnesota on Monday Night Football and played, I think, one of the better games uh, if not the best game I ever played there. And that was a tough place to play. And I can go on and on. So I don't know if it was what – so when 
when I was uh, when I was injured in in the, the few times that the management said maybe you should sit, I always re- referred back to well I played my best when I'm injured, and, can, and I I never really not that I can think of off the top of my head put myself in jeopardy by playing. Um, it was injuries that, you know, you, you could easily say you, you, rightfully uh, so that you could sit out and no one say, I don't know, maybe he could have played. I don't think that that was ever the case with me. Um, and not to mention I played every game, so injured or not. And so, I mean, I know what I would have done and, and, and did do in those situations. Brett, I want to talk about the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick. They got mollywopped by the Dallas Cowboys 38-3. to They're off to a 1-3 and start. I, I want to play a clip of Warren Sapp last week talking that, that the my way or the highway era is over, and that includes Bill Belichick, that he's not diminishing Bill Belichick as a great coach. He's just saying things have changed. Let's play the clip, and I want your response. Josh, Josh wants his guys to do it his way, and these kids ain't doing that no more. They don't even do it in New England no more. Come on. That, 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 that's good. That's dead. That's dead. You got to change. That's why Mike Krzyzewski and all them, Roy Williams and all them great coaches in the, you know, up and down college football said, I'm going home. I mean, college basketball said, I'm going home. <laughs> you got, it's a whole different ball game. Come on. It ain't what it used to be. Uh, don't so don't, don't, don't to... stop. Don't stop there. No, don't no, stop. Saying, this is why I call to... you the greatest guy talking yeah, football. Because you done made no. some points here. You <laughs> don't kids. you think even in New England, you can't it, it, the, the my way or the highway thing is, is out the window? Dead. 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 Dead as a door now. Dead as a door now. You can look at the tape, you can look at the penalties, <laughs> but you ain't cutting them no more. You can't. You got, you got to ride with it. This is what you pick. This is your crop. And it's a bunch of them in there that just do it their way. It's crazy. Mm. Do you think Bill Belichick has passed his expiration date, perhaps, with the way kids are today and the way NFL contracts are today? I think it's dead unless you have a Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers. Um, you you got the players that buy in and and can play. I think that's the key. You got to have the players, and I'm not knocking his players, but he doesn't have a Tom Brady out there. Uh, I think I think he. I just think that they're mediocre. Uh, I mean he he definitely rules with an iron fist. Um, and and he's it's, it's a new crop of players. You know they're young. Um, when you have a guy like Tom Brady who can manage the, the game and play at a level that that he played at, you can win a lot of games regardless of how you coach. Um, but I, I mean I agree with Warren in the sense that that the trend is going. Opposite Bill Belichick, but if he had a, if he had a, three or four stud players, uh, that I, you know we may never see a Tom Brady in our generation again. But um, again, if you had a, a player or two like that, you can coach however you want. Especially, I mean, you just think about it. You got a Tom Brady on your team. You rule with an iron fist. You go to Tom Brady and say, look. You gotta be with me. You, you gotta not complain at practice and bitch and moan. And obviously, you produce, but I need I need your help in the locker room in the in playing field. I'm sure that that's kind of the relationship they had. They uh, it was a, a give and take, and he's basically a started over with all new young players. Uh, so I agree, but I but I hope my 
my opinion makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. You, you actually made the point I most believe in, and, and I have to say that I was in error. I didn't realize, fully realize, how important Tom Brady was to Bill Belichick's coaching style, that he allowed Bill Belichick to coach the rest of the team in a very hard way because Tom tolerated it. And, and, and I'm not asking you to gloss yourself, but I'm just trying to speak uh, truth and, and specifically like in Green Bay when your quarterback refuses to come out of the game it's easier to build a team that's tough because the highest profile player is the toughest guy on the team and so that team's going to reflect that and have that kind of toughness when Mike Holmgren or anybody can point to Brett Favre and say that's our standard for toughness it allows that mentality to reach the rest of the team. Absolutely. I think that's the key is uh, your, your core good players. And I, I can think of numerous times where head coaches uh, that I played for in private said to me, look, now, I, I just want you to know I'm going to rip your ass, but I'm just doing it so everyone will know that if I can – if I can coach Brett hard, then I can coach anyone else hard. And I was like, hey, that's fine with me. Um, and most of the time I deserved it anyway. Um, so I think that that's, that's the key to anybody's coaching style. You know, if, you, if you're kind of laxed and uh, friendly, there's got to be some separation, in my opinion, from the head coach and the players. Hey, it's all right to laugh and joke around with them, but you gotta, there's got to be a fine line where you, you can't cross. And um, Belichick definitely checks the box on that. Rep, finally, uh, just some general thoughts. I think everybody kind of agrees on who the top four teams are, the Chiefs, Eagles, 49ers, Bills. Uh, and so – most people, let's think of a top five. I'm trying to figure, who, who would be the wild card fifth team that could maybe upset the clear favorites in the AFC and the NFC? I think there's five candidates, the Lions, the Ravens, the Cowboys, the Dolphins, or the Seahawks. Of that group of five, who, who do you think maybe is the fifth best team in the NFL and why? Um, well, it's tough. I, I would say Miami, uh, and, and I'll say that because how dangerous they are. Now, you know, they, they got shut down by Buffalo, but, you know, it happens. I'm not saying that, that that'll happen week in and week out, but the, the, the threat of the big play is, is always looming when you play these guys. And how, how quickly they put up 70. Uh, I just think that they, they pose a, a big danger to the rest of the league. Brett, uh, thank you so much. Good to see you on a Tuesday. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, good luck hunting. I know you don't fish. You're the only hunter I know that doesn't <laughs> fish. Craziest thing in the world. But good luck hunting this week, and uh, we'll Thanks, see you Jason. next week. That's Brett Favre. That's yep. good. Fun slinger, uh, great job as always. Uh, stay tuned, Shamika Michelle, next. Previously on Fearless. How should we react? If, if that does happen, if there is some new variant, what should we have learned from the last time? What should we do different? Well, I mean, you know, people should do their own research and, they, you know, but the research out there and CHD has posted all of these studies on, the, on the, its website, this Children's Health Defense, which, you know, it's one of the first things that I did when they had mass mandates the last time around. As I said, let's see what the actual science says about mass. And what the actual science says that they don't work to um, 
to prevent the spread of uh, respiratory viruses. And there's, you know, study after study. In fact, the CDC has admitted that they're not scientific based. Oh, uh, it, um, you know, I think it's disturbing if they do do that again. But, you know, one of the things that happened is we created this terrible precedent where, um, where the government has shown that people are willing to comply when it when it uh, when it violates the constitution. All right, welcome back. Time for some Shamika Michelle. Uh, Shamika. Uh, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Uh, I wanted to talk with you about uh, Congressman Jamal Bowman. Uh, Jamal has uh, pulled a fire alarm and, and doesn't appear to go, he's going to face any discipline for it. He's, he, he made a move of an insurrectionist uh, pulling a fire alarm near the Capitol or outside the Capitol, what, whatever. He did something stupid and foolish, and uh, he, I th he, I want to read you his statement, not really apologizing, but trying to rationalize what he did. Uh, today, as I was rushing to make a vote, I came to a door that is usually open for votes, but today was not open. I'm embarrassed to admit that I activated the fire alarm, mistakenly thinking I would open the door. I regret this and sincerely apologize for any confusion this caused. Uh, it doesn't appear anything's going to happen to Jamal Bowman. It's going to be excused. Why do you think that is? Why is he going to get away with this when uh, if it had been you or me or anybody else on January 6th, we'd probably be underneath the jail? You know, that whole statement is when somebody piss on you and tell you it's raining. I think it's complete uh, black privilege, especially when it comes to Democrats, because most of them just feel like black people are stupid. You know, I don't even understand how someone can think uh, 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 alarm is a door handle. We've seen alarms our entire lives, starting in grade school. So this is just a stupid excuse, but Democrats think black people are stupid. And honestly, Jason, I'm about to start using it myself. I wish I had known that this would go over so well when I got pulled over last week for speeding, when the officer walked to my car and said, ma'am, do you know how fast you were going? I would have said, uh, no, sir. I don't even know how I got here. I'd have just went the whole <laughs> black route <laughs> because they think we're stupid. And this, uh, TJ mentioned it early, earlier, the bigotry of uh, low expectations. Why would this even, um, you know, how can this go as something that's real? It makes no sense, except that Democrats and progressives think black people are stupid. The same black people that can't get ID, the same black people that can't read or do math, which is why they need to get rid of standardized testing. This is what it is. And so if it had been you or me in January 6th or any other white person that identifies as a right leaning or Republican, the news would still be talking about it. The fact that he put out this statement and it's kind of now we, we don't hear about it. That's what happens on that side. You, the, the, I can reword the statement for you. It really said this. You guys know I'm retarded. Come on. <laughs> Can we just forget this ever happened? I, I think the statement reads, hey, you know I'm on the right team. Let's leave this alone. And, and because, you know, this guy was like a high school or junior high principal. Mm. So he's a school principal. He knows all about fire safety and building codes. He knows exactly what he's doing. It, it, it's there is a privilege, there is a belief that I'm untouchable, mm -hmm. and and so he can do these types of things because he's untouchable. I, I can't remember the video of him arguing with somebody on the floor or outside the floor of Congress, 
where he wouldn't let the guy get past. He's all in his face, yelling and screaming at him. And I just thought this is behavior unbecoming of a congressman. It's way too aggressive. It's way too emotional. Thomas Massey. Yeah, t he and Thomas Massey. And it's way too emotional. And so now here we are. He wants to disrupt things uh, in, in Congress. And he pulls a fire alarm. And he's going to get away with it, uh, again, because we've, particularly in politics and, and under this current regime, there's not, look, because this is really nothing. And in, in, in his mind, he's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. As black people and as white liberals, Antifa, and I, we burned down buildings. Yeah. All I did was pull a fire alarm. Yep. You got people that burned down buildings and murdered people, and we looked the other way on that. What's the big deal about me pulling a fire alarm? This was just a boat. We burst a pipe in Georgia to win that election. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, yeah, and we know he's smarter than that. He's a cornball. Most cornballs are smart. So the fact that they're even believing his explanation just shows how stupid they think black people are. And that's the question, right? Because if, even if you're on the right team here, if this is a white dude, does it go virtually unnoticed? It's been, whatever it is, 24 hours later, nobody talking about it. Be Marjorie Taylor well, Greene and pull, pull the fire alarm. All hell will break loose. She's on the wrong team, though. She's on the wrong team. Yeah. I, I <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Oh, if it was Nancy, they'd look, this would be done and over with. Oh, she's mm -hmm. ancient. You could actually say she couldn't even see yeah. what she was pulling there. But take a young. If AOC, AOC did it. She's not white. Yeah. <laughs> she's white adjacent. Doesn't she have a white boyfriend? Or yeah, fiance. Yeah. That makes you white, Jason. <laughs> all white all of Congress is white. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Shamika, the other thing I, want, I needed your thoughts on, uh, Jimmy Butler, the NBA star, and his new emo look that he debuted uh, didn't go over well with me and Royce or TJ. Uh, how's it go over for a, a woman? When it comes to Jimmy Butler, I think... The word is out. It looked real <laughs> gay and Jermaine Stewartish and and real bitch. I didn't like it, but I'm seeing so many people, Jason, so many men make excuses for this. And I'm not a sports head. I didn't get whatever joke this is supposed to be. They said he was trolling. I don't know, but I am tired of black men feeling like they have to dress feminine to be funny. I don't, I don't like it. I've never liked it. I don't like it when Tyler Perry does it. I hate it. You see so many other comedians or people that can just get a joke across without having to dress feminine. I don't know why black men line up. It's like they race to the finish line to put on a dress or to, to be feminine. He even had on eyeliner, fingernail polish. I just don't get it and I don't like it. And I don't, I don't find it funny. I don't see the joke in it. I, I and I've got to be careful here because we, we talk all fair, but I think this is an appropriate question. You've got three daughters between the age 18 and 27, I believe, attractive yes. women. I, I just, their prospects just seemed diminished and smaller. And, and I, I read some stat where, and your daughters are, you know, the, the youngest one just went to college. They're all college educated. And I read somewhere like, there's six black women to every black boy on a college campus. And, and, and then by the time you throw in this switch hitting uh, alternative lifestyle stuff, what are the options out here for young black women if if these Jimmy Butler and these are the standards of a masculinity and male behavior that are acceptable? Look, the options are very low. My daughter sent me a text one day and said it was the beginning of uh, class. And she said she sat beside this really cute guy. And then he turned around and said, Girl, did you do your own work? <laughs> so 
she does not think that she has very high prospects, you know, when it comes to the men, because a lot of them are very feminine. And even if they aren't intentionally gay, they don't have any leadership qualities. She just got upset this past weekend. Someone asked her to hang out, but then he expected her to make the the arrangements. You know, where do you want to go? What do you think? What do you? And she said, Mom, isn't a man supposed to be able to make a decision? And I said, yes. And so she was just very frustrated that he couldn't make a decision and decide where they wanted to go. She felt like you asked me for my time. I've decided to stay in town an extra night so that we can go out. Yet you don't have any plans and you're having a hard time making a decision on what you would like to do. That's very frustrating for them, especially when they've been raised differently. So I do think, you know, the the prospects are very low. And sometimes I tell myself, you know, I just need to prepare perhaps for a, a white son-in-law because, I think there are a lot of good black men out here in my age range. I think it's starting to dwindle the younger they get because so many have been raised by single mothers. They mimic their actions, even if they aren't gay. It's true. And <clears throat> you, you just, and thank you, Shamika. And we'll see you later this week. But TJ, it's, she, she hits on a point that, uh, again, I've had discussions with friends of mine that have kids or whatever, and I just tell your kids need to just look for people they have shared values with, mm -hmm. and that can be the only standard, and you need to prepare for that as a parent, that your, your kids are going to click with people if they're smart. Your daughters and your sons are just going to click up with people that have shared values and skin color and all this surface level stuff uh, is going to be out the window. Uh, be because again, like a lot of my friends obviously are married, they've raised their kids with a set of values and, and then they look out into the larger allegedly black culture and a lot of these kids weren't raised with those values and it's tough sledding out there. It is tough sledding. I, one thing I tell you, I, and you've, I'm sure, experienced this, there is culture differences that you have to learn. And it's, it's just not such an easy, particularly when you're younger. I, I think it's getting better as far as, I think the, the older generations do have a lot more prejudice against the races. And as I've, I've said this for a long time, my generation may be the first that was like naturally open. Not, I, it, I was born in 1990, by the time I was, paying attention to anything, it's 2005, before you notice race and what's really going on. It's like, that was like the golden years of race in America. And so, you know, people's parents, if, if I took a um, black girl to homecoming in high school, there were some culture differences. You just, she noticed it about my family, I noticed it about her family, you noticed that. Um, and Y'all play Euchre and she plays spades. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, even Thanksgiving dinner, very different, right? There's, yeah. there's just some differences. Yeah, we use seasoning, y'all don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gained a few more pounds when I went to her house for yeah. Thanksgiving. That is the truth, but I'm with you. I mean, look, and, and wherever you can find it, particularly if you're a Christian today, I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, whatever color you are, if you got shared values, jump on that because you're not going to find many with these values. Uh, well, I think that's a wrap for us today. Uh, play some tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving all the seed When we all wanna be free We want freedom